So we, we've been talking about generational thinking, that God's ways are not our ways, His thoughts are not our thoughts, that we sometimes live our lives just based on the, this dash, the dash between when we were born and when we die. And we're not actually conscious of what God actually wants to do in and through us. And God invites us to take on His thoughts, His way of thinking. His ways, what He does, because what we do, the choices that we make are not only going to affect you in this life, they are going to affect generations beyond you. And God wants us to take on those thoughts, to think that, listen, the influence that God has given me on this planet is way beyond me, that God wants me to think about my business, about my life, about what I'm doing, and to think maybe I can pass this on to other generations who can continue that for the kingdom's sake. Amen. So God invites us to think generationally. He spoke to Abraham, and he spoke to Abraham and said, listen, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to, out of you are going to be many nations that are going to experience that blessing. Yet, he only had Isaac. But yet, we are the fruit of many nations right now because of Abraham and his choices. He spoke to Paul. He said, Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, Timothy, I want you to find faithful men who will also teach others. So he was saying, look, whatever we do, it needs to be passed down. Those values, those beliefs need to be flowing to the next generation. And then Jesus, he picked disciples and he gave them a specific purpose. And that has been going on for 2,000 years. You're a product of that. Amen. In John 14, 12, he says, the person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. So the same works that Jesus did, he's asking us to do. There's many, many scriptures, which I'm not going to bore you with, where it's talking about generations and generations to come. Here are some in Psalms. It says, I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the peoples will give you thanks forever and ever. So we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. To all generations, we will tell of your praise. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. In Deuteronomy, he says, I want it to go well with you and your children and your children's children. So he's saying, I want them to model something, you, you must model something to them, that they can model that to others, and that it can carry on. Now, sometimes... We are the product of a generation that might be a little bit dysfunctional. And what happens is we then take on that dysfunction, we own it as an identity, and then we live our lives in the excuse of that dysfunction. And we will say, well, my father was like that, and my grandfather was like that, and my great-grandfather was like that. And we take on a dysfunction and then we justify that dysfunction and we live in the excuse of that. You do know that you can break free from those dysfunctions. Okay, I've got one amen there. You can break free from those dysfunctions because we have a new genealogy. I get to choose how I respond to life, to God's promises and His warnings. Now God gives you and I warnings not because God is going to punish me. No, he gives me a warning that the fruit of my choices are going to produce something. So I need to choose life. I need to choose his promises. I need to choose his warnings. Okay, so what is one of the, the warnings? Read it in Proverbs chapter 5 about an adulterous woman. It says it's going to reduce you to a crust of bread. That's what's going to happen. You're going to end up, your life is going to be a mess if you choose adultery. That's just a warning. It's not God punishing you. So must I explain it again? The doom can. You know doom? It says harmful if swallowed. If I take doom and I spray it in my mouth, there isn't a camera there in the doom can that goes to the doom factory and they are sitting there with machine guns and when they see me spraying it in my mouth, they send the guys with machine guns to come kill me. No. No. It's not the doom factory that kills me. It's the contents that kills me. And when I sin, it's sin that kills me. It's not God killing me when I've sinned. 
The wages of sin is death. It doesn't say God kills you when you sin. No, the contents of it is what kills me. So God warns me, choose life, choose blessing, choose my ways, because I have my, my intent toward you is good. So when you choose me, you'll experience good. Amen. So don't, don't allow the dysfunction to disqualify you from what God wants to do in and through you. God always uses flawed people. Look at me, for example. Look in the mirror, for example. God uses flawed people. But it's when I begin to align my beliefs up with the truth of God's word that I start to experience life, peace, joy, abundance. Amen. Because I'm realigning my identity from my genealogy to my new genealogy. Amen. So Paul says this. We are a part of a new generation. In 1 Timothy, he's right, Paul writing to Timothy, he says this. Paul, an apostle, special messenger of Christ Jesus by appointment, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus the Messiah, our hope, to you, Timothy, my true son in the faith, listen to God's intent toward you. Grace, spiritual blessing and favor, mercy, and heart peace be yours from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So he's saying this is God's intent toward you. Grace, favor, peace, mercy. He's saying those are yours from God. That's God's desire for you. Verse 3. As I urged you when I was on my way to Macedonia, stay on where you are at Ephesus in order that you may warn, admonish, and charge certain individuals not to teach any different doctrine. So he's talking about doctrine here. He's saying, I want to, I'm charging you, Timothy, to warn, admonish, and teach others not to get involved in other doctrines. So the doctrine he's talking about here is there were Judaizers who followed Paul everywhere he went. So Paul was a legalist. Paul grew up under Gamaliel to be one of the chief priests of the law. And he gives his credentials, Paul. He said that I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He'd studied his whole life to be a master of the law, of the commandments. He has an encounter with Jesus. And he realizes that Jesus is enough. That he's the one who fulfilled the law. That he's the one who went to the cross. He's the one who paid the price for sin. And that it is now by grace through faith. Not by grace through faith plus effort. And so Paul was preaching this message. That this is about believing first. Not about you trying to do something to please God. The commandments were based on your obedience. And if you did this, you got blessed. They were conditional. Jesus comes, he fulfills that, he says... I am enough for you. Trust in me and you are blessed. Trust in me, you are in the favor of God. Trust in me, you are declared righteous and made righteous. So Jesus is preaching this message. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. But then the Judaizers followed him and said, yes, you are saved by grace, but you still need to do the law. And that's what he's saying here. Timothy, warn, admonish, teach others that this is not Jesus plus the law, it's Jesus plus nothing. So he's saying that in verse 3. Then he goes on, verse 4, nor to give importance to or occupy themselves with legends, fables, myths, and endless genealogies. So it's, he's saying, listen, maybe if you put onion out at night, it's going to draw all the flu there. He says, don't listen to fables and myths. What are some other fables and myths that you can think of? That old wives' tales that we think as being true. He's saying, don't listen to that stuff. And endless genealogies, generations, where you come from. He's saying, don't listen to these things to, to derive your sense of worth and your identity. Well, you know, well, do you know who my father was? Well, my father was an alcoholic, and his father was an alcoholic, so that means I'm going to be an alcoholic. Talking about genealogies, deriving our dysfunction, our sense of worth from where we were born. What, you know, can you imagine my opa Groeki? My opa Groeki, he was a good olivier, he had samen met General Smuts. Op sy paard. 
concentratie kan toegegaan om die mensen te laten vrijlaten. Nou, hij was een goede Afrikaner. Can you imagine? My dad married an English woman. He's turning in his grave. I can say Willie Fee, and we grew up English, and I can talk a Saudi khatra. Now, can you imagine? He's turning in his grave. Now, can you imagine if I'm trying to derive my sense of worth and identity out of where I come from? And that's how we live. We live well. Don't you know who I am? Trying to look to an earthly genealogy for identity. And he's saying, listen, don't waste your time with endless genealogies. He goes on here. Which foster and promote useless speculations and questionings rather than acceptance in faith of God's administration and the divine training that is in faith. A, in leaning that of the entire human personality, personality on God in absolute trust and confidence. Whereas the object and purpose of our instruction and charge is love, which springs from a pure heart and a good, clear conscience and sincere, unfeigned faith. He's saying there is only one command. There's only one thing that we need to look to, and that is love from a pure heart. That is the goal of the instruction. That is the goal of the law. Love. Understanding his love for me. Verse 6. But certain individuals have missed the mark on this very matter and have wandered away into vain arguments, discussions, and purposeless talk. They are ambitious to be doctors of the law, teachers of the mosaic ritual, but they have no understanding either of the words and terms they use or of the subjects about which they make dogmatic assertions. How many people do you know that they are so religious in trying to explain the law to us? And the Bible says that we must not be drawn away from the simplicity of Christ. The message of Christ is simple. Theology makes you complicated, makes things complicated. In Titus 3, 9, but avoid stupid and foolish stupid. Stupid and foolish controversies and genealogies and dissensions and wrangling about the law, for they are unprofitable and futile. Making it very clear in Afrikaans. Maar jij moet jou niet inlaat met dwaze strijdvraag en geslagsregisters en met getwist en strijderij oor die wet van Moses nie, want dit is nutteloos en sinloos. That's what he's saying. Don't get into arguments about the law, about what the law required and what the law doesn't require because Jesus fulfilled the law for righteousness. And that's what he's saying. I can't derive my identity out of where do I come from? Because I now derive my identity from where I come from. Maybe you'll get that tomorrow. <laughs> I don't derive my identity from where I come from. I derive, derive my identity from where I come from. Where do I come from? 1 Peter 1.23 it says, you have been born or regenerated, born again, not from a mortal origin, a seed or a sperm, but from one that is immortal by the ever-living and lasting word of God. Saying, I have a new genealogy. I have not been born of mortal origin. I've been born of the seed or the sperm of God. God is now my father. My father is not my father. My father is my father. How many of you know Star Wars? Yeah, one, one or two hands. I am your father. In Galatians 2, it says it this way in the Amplified. For I through the law, so Paul is talking about the difference between law and grace. So law places a demand on you. Grace has already supplied for you. The law is telling you what you need to do to get blessed. Grace shows you that you are already blessed. And that's a big difference. So Paul is writing here to the Galatians saying, look, guys, I through the law, under the operation of the curse of the law, have in Christ's death for me, myself died to the law and all the law's demands upon me so that I may henceforth live to and for God. So what's he saying? He's saying, listen, everything that the law demanded of me, because I've been included in Christ, all of the law's demands no longer apply to me. I'm no longer under that system. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. 
In him, I've shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in, by adherence to and reliance on and complete trust in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. He's saying, because I've been included in his crucifixion, what the law demanded that was placed upon me, I'm no longer under that influence. I'm now under the influence of the Son of God who died for me. And because he died for me, I was included in that resurrection. Why? Because he loved me. He gave himself up for me. Verse 21. Therefore, because of this, I do not treat God's gracious gift as something of minor importance and defeat its very purpose. I do not set aside, invalidate, and frustrate and nullify the grace, unmerited favor of God. For if justification... Righteousness, acquittal from guilt, comes through observing the ritual of the law, then Christ the Messiah died groundlessly and to no purpose and in vain. His death was then wholly superfluous. What he's saying here in this portion of scripture, he's saying that I cut myself from God's ability, from God's grace, when I try to accomplish it in my own effort. That's what he's saying. We say to people when they've fallen from grace, No, they've fallen in sin. No, he's saying you fall from grace when you try to be justified by self-effort. When you come to God with your successes or your failures, thinking that you're either qualified or not qualified based on following some legal demand from the law. He's saying, when I do that, I cut myself from God's grace, God's ability to flow in me, because God's ability flows through righteousness, through the abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness. That is where life begins to flow. So as long as I'm putting this commandment, this demand, this perception of what I need to do for God to do something, I'm cutting myself from God's grace. In the Passion, it says this, but because the Messiah lives in me, I've now died to the law's dominion over me so that I can live for God. My old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. So where I derived my identity, it says it no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine, for the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me. And he dispenses his life into mine. I like that. It's like a jug being poured into something. He's saying that he now dispenses, he pours his life into you so that you can know what, he, what oneness is. So that is why I don't view God's grace as something minor or peripheral. For if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, the anointed one would have died for nothing. If trying to fulfill the law in my own strength was what God required from me, man, we're in trouble. Because the Bible says the law is perfect and holy, but it is weak because of us and our flesh. So Jesus knew that. He came and fulfilled it for me, for you, so that his life could be manifest through believing. In John 1, I'm closing with this. It says, but as many as received him, received there means to take hold of, to make use of. Those who have received him, those who have taken hold of Jesus to make use of him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You have been not born just by the will of flesh, by the will of two people getting together saying we're going to have children. It's like, no, no. You need to know, you were born of God. When you believe on him, you are born regenerated. The sperm, the nature, the life of God comes and lives inside of you. And I now derive my identity, not from my parents. I derive my identity from my father. Because I have a new genealogy. I'm part of a new generation that is now dispensing the life of Christ, which has been poured into me, I pour it into others. Maybe... You've come here this morning looking for a sense of worth, a sense of identity, a sense of freedom. 
The Bible says that it is only found in believing in Jesus as the one who loves you, who cares for you. And when I believe in him, I have a new identity. I have a new nature. I have the life of Christ in me. And there's nothing that I could do now to disappoint God. There's nothing I could do to just to make him happy. No, God is so happy. He has this expectation of his expectancy being fulfilled in your life. And all he asks is that you trust him because faith works by love. Can you believe that he loves you, he cares for you, considers you precious, wants the best for you? So in this environment, you now have a choice as to what you're going to believe. Am I going to believe condemnation and judgment? Or am I going to believe favor, mercy, kindness, goodness? What are you going to believe this morning? You choose. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me, that you rose again, and that you are Lord of all. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved me. Come and live in me. Thank you that I'm forgiven. That I've been made righteous because of your blood. And that I am your child and can call you Abba Father. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, that our identity is derived from you and you alone. That you are Lord of all. And that we belong to you as children of God. Father, we thank you for righteousness. We thank you for grace, for favor, for love that is ours, Lord, that we are part of a new genealogy, sons and daughters of God. And we carry your name. We have an expectation of your goodness in the land of the living, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You are highly favored and deeply loved of God. Amen.